it's about the product manager interview. Uh, you have a great background and great history at Yammer and a lot of different startups at General Assembly. My first question for you is, can you tell me a little bit more about yourself and uh, what you do as a PM? Yeah, totally. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm currently a product manager at Yammer. Uh, for those that don't know, Yammer is an enterprise social network. So we build a product that helps companies and uh, organizations collaborate. And so uh, we believe in sort of openness and um, a social approach to work as opposed to being stuck in email all day. Um, so I've been here, you know, pre and post Microsoft. Um, so we were acquired by Microsoft uh, last year, um, and have been working on a lot of integration stuff around the whole Microsoft Office suite. Uh, prior to that, I started my own company in the education space. Um, it's called I Need a Pencil .com. It's a funny name, um, but it was basically free SAT prep geared at underserved high school students that monetized on college um, and scholarship programs that were interested in basically recruiting the students that we had in our program. Um, so I did that for about six or seven years, um, and then I've been at Yammer for about a year and a half now. Great. So my first question for you is, what's the most challenging PM interview question that you've ever answered? Yeah, um, so for me it was probably, uh, I was talking to Facebook actually a while ago, um, and I remember them asking me something along the lines of, you know, where do you see Facebook in 10 years? Mm -hmm. um, it's a simple question on the surface, and there are probably, you know, grand answers that can be given. Um, but it was hard for me for two reasons. Uh, one was that honestly, I hadn't prepared that much and put that much thought into my vision for Facebook. Um, it's a, kind of a rookie mistake to just not think that much about where a company could be headed um, down the road. Um, so that was one part of how it was hard. And then, you know, obviously Facebook is such a large product now and they're into so many different spaces that I remember part of my answer being something around like banking and how Facebook Facebook could be so integral to our day-to-day -day life um, that among other like things I had in mind at the time I mentioned an idea like that and it was hard to know what is like truly crazy and what's visionary um, and it was a really fine line. Um, so that was probably one of the hardest uh, questions I've had and it ended up sounding like I imagine some sort of apocalypse happening in 10 years um, that wasn't a good answer at all. So if you could uh, take back that moment and if you had a chance to answer that question again, how would you approach it? Um, well, to be honest, so I, I would say it's around identity. So I would, I see in, in 10 years, right, like Facebook already is our identity, but it's not embedded in our lives as seamlessly as something like Google Glass has the potential to be. Um, so I could see, you know, Facebook in 10 years where it's not just a website, a mobile app where you have to deliberately, like, pull and push information, right? It's just seamlessly integrated and whether, you know, you're walking around, you see people, that's obviously a class type of thing. You can understand who you're talking to, but this is all of your moments are, like, recorded and personally, like, I don't know, you personally you could control, you can still control the flow of information, um, but it's not nearly as heavy as I think it is today, even though they've invested so much in making a life experience. That's an overarching answer, but you could probably tell that even now, I still probably don't have a great answer to that question, otherwise I'd probably go off and build it. Got it. Well, good. How about on the other side of the table? Uh, as an interviewer, you know, what's your favorite question to ask PM candidates? So one that I'd like to do is um, I basically take out my phone and pick an app that I recently downloaded and ask a PM candidate to basically walk me through their use of the app and what they like and don't like about it. Um, and why they think certain decisions were made. Um, so I recently had a candidate walk me through Rise, which is like a alarm clock app. Um, and it's extremely simple, so it's not very easy for a candidate um, who's not discerning to walk me through it because they could just be like, oh, well, it's just an alarm clock app, and then there's just a time. Uh, and, and they don't catch all the nuances of the interactions or understand how engagement for an app like that could be measured. Um, they might something They might say something like, you know, how many times was this app downloaded as opposed to, like, measuring, well, have they changed the time of the alarm often? And have they interacted with some of the additional functionality, like setting sounds when you wake up and things like that? Um, and not to say that they should only be focused on those sort of local metrics. They should probably be focused on downloads and focused on how many days a week people use the app. Um, but it gives a sense of what's important to that person. Um, and even if they don't have you know, product background or maybe they've never done like analytics or user research before, it gives them an opportunity to articulate how important those things are to them and 
even if they don't have resume experience experience with it, maybe they actually do understand some things like that. So it's just it's just a really casual way of getting into a lot of different facets of somebody's product background and vision. Got it. And how about if the candidate looks at one of the apps on your phone and they've never used it before? Do you think it's uh, you know is that fair game to ask them about an application that they've never used? I think it's fair game. I mean, I think it's certainly taken into consideration that they've never used it before. So there would, you know, if they have questions about, you know, the value proposition of something, or if they caveat by saying, "Well, I would never use this, but here, here are my thoughts on it anyway." I, I think that's okay and acceptable. And they might, you know, if they stumble on things that they're stumbling on just because they're new to it, as opposed to their product sense. It's up to me as the interviewer, I guess, to capture that and understand it and not hold it against them. But as product people, we're always, like at Yammer, we always look at what's out there in the market and have on-the-fly conversations about new things that are out there. And we're not afraid to be wrong when we're talking. To, obviously, we're not being interviewed um, when we're talking to colleagues. But we have conversations about things all the time. So if somebody can't form an opinion on the fly, um, that could be a red flag. And honestly, it's really easy to prepare a canned response to expected questions otherwise, so it's actually really important sometimes that they haven't seen the app before because it helps get past any prepared responses they might have already had. Makes sense. Okay. You just I recently gave a, a, a talk about being a PM and PM interviews, and in your talk, one of the questions that you featured was the following. How would you remove, add, or change uh, Yammer? How would you recommend a candidate approach this? And what are you looking for in an A-plus response? Sure. So again, as we mentioned before, I can't go into too much detail about what we look for, because sometimes we might use that question here. Um, but what I would say is that with a question like that, it's so open. And you could just basically, I would show somebody a screenshot of our product when they respond to the question. Um, so I think a couple things I would say would be, one, is, is think broader than the medium in which like the question is presented, right? So it's shown as a screenshot, and I often find people then diving into very small details about the design of the page as opposed to thinking more broadly about the product and what we're trying to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, so people will say things around like, you know, changing fonts and, um, I don't know, things that are really relatively minor in, in the sense that we're looking for and not saying things about, say, the feed, which is the core part of the product, um, and it doesn't look, it doesn't grab your attention for any reason because there are feeds in pretty much every social product, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn um, or anybody else for that matter. So people tend to skip over the feed, but it shows that like they're really, if somebody just is drawn to really small details, we can tell that like they're not thinking about the big picture and about like the vision for the product. Um, so one thing would be just like don't only think about what was given to you, think more broadly than that, um, and ask questions of like a lot of times people will just dive into, you know, just like any other uh, interview, this applies for like consulting interviews as well, where right, you're, it's totally fair game to ask questions like, well, what is, in this case, like, you know, well, what have you tried in the past? Or, you know, what are you trying, to, what are your most important metrics or things like that? Um, in a consulting interview, you could ask things like, you know, well, what's the size of the market that we're talking about? Or sometimes that's what they're asking you to figure out, I guess, so you couldn't ask that if that was the case. But anyway, so it's, Thinking outside of the context of, of what the question was, thinking about what metrics matter to the product, um, and I think A plus candidates can really balance the metrics that we want to move with the uh, trade offs that come with that. So product is all about like making trade offs, right? You can anybody can come up with a hundred features to build. Mm -hmm. um, that's why it's also a trap because the question asks you like to some extent what would you add, and so people dive into oh I would add this 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 and this, and they don't really have a sense of well, all those things cost engineering resources to build, add complexity to the product, and so on. Um, but an A-plus candidate would be able to balance the trade-offs of those decisions um, and understand the implications of you know, whether it's adding something new or removing something existing. OK, great. Another question that you featured in your talk was uh, one that was actually related to, to Facebook. Um, and it goes like this. You know, say you're a product manager at Facebook. You released a change to the publisher that increased days engaged meaningfully, but also reduced posting and invites sent. My question for you is, how would you recommend a PM candidate approach this? 
Right. So somewhat similarly to the last question, you often want to start with a goal. Um, and in this case, you know, it's common that people um, get a little bit confused with the metrics that are presented. And a lot of people skip over the fact that when you change something in the publisher, which is the place where you can you know, update your status or check in or share a photo, um, a goal with a change to that uh, should probably almost never reduce posting, which is the measure of whether or not people are sharing information. Um, so even though you increase days engaged, a lot of people like get attracted to that and forget that, well, that's great that people are coming to the product on more days in a given week, but they're not sharing information as much, and they're also inviting less of their friends, which might be indicative of, you know, less satisfaction with the product. Um, that being said, you know, a really good PM candidate would also think through, like, what are what are the behavioral implications of the metrics? So, when you get days engaged going up, but people are sharing less, what does that really mean? Well, my interpretation generally of that is that you're creating kind of a lurker class more and more. You're growing the lurker class. So a good PM candidate would call that out and say, well, and then tie it back to the goals and say, well, for the long-term health of Facebook, even though it is largely, you know, used for sometimes just consuming information and, and lurking, for the long-term health of the product, we do need to ensure that people are still posting. And so not only did the feature reduce the thing it was supposed to increase, but it also puts at risk the long-term health of the product um, because the asset that was being created by increasing posting or hypothetically increasing posting is actually being diminished. Um, so, so a really good PM candidate would understand the goals, set those up, ask questions around it if they needed to, interpret the metrics correctly, and not get attracted to, um, you know, seemingly shiny things um, that aren't actually about the goal of the feature. Um, and then they would also call out like environmental factors or important facts. So, in the case of Facebook, uh, and specific to their context, you know, they have a more than a billion users, um, and I saw a core post recently that talked about like how many users could Facebook have if you consider how many people even have access to the internet, and then I think it's something like 2.4 billion. And you subtract like 700 million people whose countries ban access to Facebook, so now you're looking at 1.7 billion, and they already have 1.1, 1.2 billion of those. Right. So the product like that, where they've saturated their their potential user base for the most part, and they still have a little ways to go, but they've gotten pretty much you know most people that they could get onto their platform, it would, a good candidate would also call out the fact that the fact that invites sent is down, which is a virality metric, isn't necessarily as bad as it might seem because given where their product is, that's not necessarily as critical of a metric to be measuring anymore compared to when they first launched in 2004 or compared to a different app um, like Path, for example, which recently I think hit something like 10 million users registered, maybe not active, um, which is obviously an important distinction. but they would call out that Facebook's a more mature product, and so something like virality, um, had posting not gone down, virality would have been something that they may or may not have been okay with hitting in order to get other benefits. Um, so those are the sort of things that I would look for in a candidate's response. Sounds like a strong response, or strong candidate, really understands the nuances, the trade-offs, the, the pros, the cons, short-term, long-term, yeah. The, the details of the product as well as the big picture. Is that is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I think that's a really good distillation of, of what we just talked about because you're I think what you're also implicitly calling out is that an average candidate or most anybody could say something like, Well, oh, it's bad that these other things went down and I would, you know, try to understand why. That's that's basic. But if somebody you know, we can get anybody pretty much in the door and answer questions like that. Anybody that works in, say, tech or, you know, has had some sort of product or, you know, um, product management experience. But it's more those sort of things that you pointed out around nuances and trade-offs and the more complicated things that are much harder on a day-to-day -day basis as a PM. And that's where we really separate, you know, the 99% from the 1%. Got it. Okay. My next question for you is, uh, you know, how these PM interviews uh, happen is they're usually buried at the end of the week and you're usually busy Monday through Wednesday and you're like, crap, it's Wednesday night. I've got an interview uh, tomorrow with a really prestigious firm, whether it's Yammer or Facebook or Google. If a candidate only had four hours to prepare, right. how would you, like, what would you recommend? What would be a good use of, of using those four hours? 
Yeah, so personally, it ties back a little bit to the uh, Facebook question I mentioned that I answered terribly um, a long time ago, and it has to do with, like, just re if you only have four hours, like, review everything you know about the company itself, right? Because you're not going to learn how to do product management in four hours. You're not going to figure out some, like, magical framework that's going to help you answer any question that they might bring up. But what you can do and what I think would be most useful to have top of mind right before the interview is knowing, like, oh, did the company raise a bunch of money lately and they're trying to do expansion? So they're probably, you know, they might want somebody who can do, like, internationalization really well or, you know, what, read reviews of the product online and understand what users are saying about it so that you don't necessarily just come in and rattle off, like, app store reviews, but that you understand the sort of pain that users are facing and you could talk to the product team there about how, you know, they would balance data with what users are saying because you know actual things that people are, are saying on the App Store reviews or anywhere else. So anyway, for me, I would just say, like, know the company in and out, and during the interview, you can do the unpacking and the interpretation of that sort of information, but you can't be, like, on your iPhone researching the company while you're trying to interview um, and answer a question. So you should know that ahead of time. Got it. How about if the same candidate had a little bit more foresight, and rather than start the night before, they started a week before? What additional preparation would you recommend with that additional time? So in addition to the, the standard, like, okay, know the company, try to understand what their metrics are, try to understand, like, what their product needs are, the thing I think would be most useful with, say, a week of time to prepare um, is spending time studying other products really well and, under, like, thinking about them in and out, understanding why they made this decision and not that decision. You have the time to research, like, everything. So you should know... Spotify in and out. You should know Yelp in and out. You should know Facebook. You should know that they released chat heads recently. Why did they do that? What are the pros and cons of having this little bubble in the mobile app now? Like, is that an interaction that their users would get? Would it not? Are they trying to increase mobile app usage? And if so, like, what does that say about the broader company strategy? Um, so one of my favorite exercises when people don't know, like, people who come to me wanting help preparing for product interviews related to that question I mentioned before about walking through an app, um, but it's really just digging into a bunch of different products and picking apart the rationale that their product team might have had for doing any number of things. Okay. My next question for you is the, the whiteboard. A lot of candidates are afraid of the whiteboard. They're afraid that the interviewer is going to ask them to get up there and wireframe a new product concept, or they're afraid that uh, interviewer is going to ask them to go up to the whiteboard and do a coding question. What are some of your tips when it comes to the whiteboard? Um, I mean, one is stay calm, right? It's pretty obvious and basic, but stay calm. You know, nobody likes to necessarily be put on the spot and have everybody scrutinizing what their ideas are. So the interviewer realizes that, and it's only when a candidate lets that stop them from really, you know, believing in their ideas that it's a problem. Otherwise, it's totally okay to erase things or, like, say, you know, I know this is really poorly designed, but it's just a first cut, or co you can caveat things. But sometimes there are people who are so um, sort of self-critical of what they're putting up there, and they're so nervous about it that it prevents them from putting anything out there at all, almost, um, or that it distracts them so much that they can't get across a basic concept um, that then we can't even have a conversation about it. So, you know, it's, it's sort of stay calm, just remember what you already thought about for the product interview and the sort of things you want to convey, mm -hmm. and just get something out there. Like, nobody expects the most beautiful mock-up of some product you've never thought about, but the, it's always about, like, what is your reasoning? Even if your, like, final answer was wrong, could you think through this problem correctly, at least, so we can have faith in your ability to do it in the future? Because we know on the job you're going to have more than, you know, five minutes with, you know, four people staring at you um, when you're solving problems, so a good interviewer would be able to tease apart, you know, what's happening because of the interview and what's happening because of your raw skill. Um, and so I think as long as people can get something out there, then, you know, they don't need it to be totally polished, and most interviewers who are, are quality interviewers in places that you would want to work would be able to separate out your skill. Okay, great. That's all the prepared questions that I have. Do you have any last words of wisdom, advice, tips for people who are getting ready for their product manager interviews? Um, well, I would say that right now there's a really interesting thing going on in product and product management where there are so many people who want to work in product um, but face this catch-22 of not having had product experience before. 
Um, so what I would say, and that's one of the most common questions that comes up in these classes um, around how to get a job in product management, um, what I would advise people like that or thinking about that is that you should try to do as much as you can before the PM interview to convince whoever's trying to hire you, uh, that you can get things done. So whether that's building a side project, right? Like maybe you know how to code if you were an engineer and you're trying to become a PM. Maybe you can build, you know, a simple web application that shows how you think as a product person. Or if you were a designer, maybe you could just come up with basic flows that you would recommend the product, you know, incorporate into the, um, what they already have. Uh, things that show that people actually do stuff is extremely important because as a PM, you'll often find any number of roadblocks to actually shipping uh, a feature. And so people who have a track record of perseverance and building real stuff and not just riding on the backs of other people who do all the hard work, um, that can be a really powerful asset. Um, if you've never had the product management role, it'll help convince people that you can do the job even if your resume doesn't say so. Fantastic tips. Thank you so much for your time, Jason. Really appreciate your insights on the product manager interview. So thanks again, and uh, thanks for having me. Best, best of luck with everything at Yammer. All right. Thanks a lot, Lewis. Appreciate it. Bye. Okay, bye.